Hello and welcome to the Musical Instrument Investigator. My name's Sheldon and as promised I said I would start interviewing people so it's the summer or kind of uh, a British summer uh, so I thought why not uh, I'll just crack on with it. So I'm pleased to say I'm here with the wonderful Andrew Atkinson, a craftsperson, luthier, enthusiast, man of many talents, guitar player, fiddle player, cornet player uh, and yeah I just thought it'd be really nice to uh, show the audience kind of some of the things that you've done and also to talk about um, some of the uh, experience, experiments that you've uh, done with musical instruments because I remember when I did my master's degree in musical instruments one of the references I used was your work oh. about building a lute uh, from kind of historic documents and actually making the tools um, for the lute before even making like the lute historically so I thought that was a really interesting project so I think it'd just be nice to get a bit of an overview really of um, kind of your background and how you kind of ended up around musical instruments and tools and all of that uh, kind of stuff. I think I can blame me, me middle brother because he came home from school with a, I think it was a Charles Haywood woodworking book and woodworking books were always very out of date they were always very a bit behind the times and had these old wooden planes in so I was intrigued by them. And then later on he bought a molding plane. So I started getting interested in old tools. Uh, at the same time, I'll be around about the same time, I started playing the guitar. Uh, so I got obsessed with guitars. And then later on, uh, so I've been obsessed with guitars for a long time. I, I did a guitar making course at London Met where I made these fine items. And um, then later on, anyway, I, I was, I was, I'd left college and I had, obviously I hadn't done much, but I still messed around doing woodwork. And, um, and I went to the early music show and I picked up a lute and I thought I'd like to try and make one. And I got some plans and it said, uh, it's recommended to use masking tape to clamp the ribs together and make an aluminium rib template. And I thought aluminium, it wasn't isolated until uh, in the 19th century. So I was wondering how it could have been done, would have been done in the past. So I, I registered to do a masters and I thought I'd combine my two interests and crafts his craft history which I, I'm getting I was getting interested in and music and sort of trying to combine the two and try and make a lute uh, using historic methods and I'd, so I got some advice of various people and and I did this masters but I never actually made a lute until after so I just made a few tools and the idea was that, uh, that lute, make, lute makers would use the usual woodworking tools with a few specialist ones so luckily uh, Jesus and Joseph are carpenters, so there's lots of pictures of tools and manuscripts. So I was trying to find pictures of stuff that was uh, of the right time period. So I started making tools uh, with the idea of making a lute. And after I finished the Masters, uh, I made the lute over about three or four years, just gradually. And then uh, tried to use old fashioned methods. And I followed Ian Howard's translation of Arno of Zwolle. Um, loot manuscript thing, and I'm trying to make the loot upstairs actually, and maybe get it out later. <laughs> but yeah, it's a an obsession. So I haven't made much stuff because I just tend to be too lazy, and also I, um, I end up making it hard for myself. Because another thing I like to do is I like to use wood that I've um, dried myself and cut myself. But uh, yeah. but uh, it's like, quite fun. It's nice to know what people say oh, that, that that bit of wood came from. But usually the churchyard, but anyway. And then your work on lutes got published by the Lute Society, and you can see it online, can't you? So I can put, I'll put a link to anyone oh. that's interested in the description um, to that kind of publication. It's a really fascinating look at the tools and also the tools that you made, and then oh. the lute as well. So that's really great, and I'll cut in some footage of the oh, the yeah. lute here as well, so you can see that. This, this is the the, the lute that's, that I mentioned that. I, uh, this, this is the thing really I suppose that got me started in the historical instrument making uh, using the historic tools thing so I want I, got, I tried to make this even though it's not meant to be a very authentic design it's it's I tried to make it as close as possible to the instructions given by Anna or Zwolle so I made I, I designed it Around, somebody told me the lute string length and I designed the body and the ratios that he gave me his manuscript and, uh, and, and I tried to use the methods so he said so instead of using masking tape to pull the ribs together I used bits of 
handmade paper, which is stronger in one direction. Well, stronger in all directions, actually. It's got a more random grain, and uh, modern paper tends to have a grain because it's made by a machine. It tends to, have a, tends to be lined up, the fibres. So I use that, and you use a hot iron, and I heat that in that oven on the grass cooker, and you set one end with a bit of glue on, and then you, you can pull it. And, you, and, I, and, I, and I, had, I wasn't sure to do it like that, but, I, but you can actually do it with strips that way. But it's on the Lutzerite website, what I eventually concluded was the best. And I still haven't really scraped them off, but, um, but you can see a couple of scorch marks here and there, where I did it with a, a pot of in. Uh, maybe I didn't, maybe you can't see them now. But this has been lying, on for a thing, unloved. Uh, I did my own funny little loot rose design. And uh, I, all my stuff was in storage, so I had the worst bits of spruce to use. And I glued up several strips. And um, But this, that's made out of sycamore from the churchyard, as usual, cut by hand. Nice plain stuff that bends nicely. And I, I made my own bend and iron thing, it's all on the site. And, uh, and, I, and I used sort of historic tools, kind of thing. I've got the, the bow saw, I used this on the floor here, in fact. So I made my own bow saw, so I used this sort of saw. Uh, and that's a, I've got a, te a old tenon saw, and I, and I used tin snips, and I cut the blade in half, and I, I think I refiled. Oh no, I might just sharpen the teeth. Oh no, I refiled it, you can see there's the back was on there. So I filed the funny teeth, and I've made the wooden. It's a bit rough and heavy duty, but, but that, I, I used that making this. And uh, But I used modern ish chisels because they haven't really changed that uh, changed that much and uh, it's held together weirdly enough I know I could play it very well and it's got the terrible modern strings on but, but uh, the pegs are whittled as well I think I made them from um, I think they were elder from the no lilac these are lilac from the lilac tree in the front from the light tree in the lady in the street and the next nailed on the head's nailed on. That came off. I was carrying to show it to somebody. I just put some high glue in and tapped the nail back in and it's okay. And the, the neck's nailed on inside there and I, and I got a proper wrought iron nail uh, made. I got them for nothing from Bloke in Sheffield. But anyway, so that's it. And, I, and since then I've been trying to make violins using uh, historical tools and methods as well. Or oh, uh, methods that might be not used in the past. Uh, to try and get into the shoes of, uh, of uh, the makers of the past who are so respected now. Anyway. Other than that, you've also been making other instruments as well. Well, you made some really interesting planes as well, kind of more oh, contemporary yeah. wooden planes with scrolls on, also oh. some carved uh, pigs as well, and also even oh, some, yeah. some violins, some fiddles, I think, as well. Oh, so. yeah. um, yeah, um, I got a lot of sycamore from the churchyard, so I started trying to make a violin. Um, oh yeah, the Lutz Society, um, Chris Goodwin that runs the Lutz Society, seemed to be quite interested in the project. So I did three talks, or four talks, um, and, um, and, the, and somebody wrote them up. They wrote them up very kindly, and uh, they've got it on the Lutz Society website. The transcripts would be funny, rambling talks. Um, a few years later... I think it's because of me, my talks were sort of entertaining-ish. I got invited to a talk at the um, British Violin Making Society, <laughs> British Violin Making Association's 20th uh, birthday celebration. And I still don't know why they asked me. I thought somebody was having a joke. But anyway, I, I did a talk there, so I started getting into violin making, trying to use historic methods. And I did this talk, the most insane talk, to try to show over 300 odd slides and the video. And uh, at the end, there was no questions. But two blokes I'd befriended said, uh, so we knew we were going to get a lecture, but we didn't know we were going to get a stand-up comedian. So I thought I'd done really well, but there was no questions, so I think I, was, I, think I overwhelmed people with a, the strange information. But, uh, but there's a couple of people who seem to have, were interested, and there's uh, some people, uh, there's definitely one respected maker I'm not going to mention, because it might embarrass him. He seems to have... Uh, he's, he's doing that kind of thing anyway, but he's done it. He's, he's quite uh, quite liked the idea of doing stuff using trying to use old methods. And the idea was, I was thinking, well, if these instruments are so valued from the past, it'd be quite you know be quite good to try and perhaps discover or even get a 
flavour of how they might have worked and stuff. I'm not really good at thinking about the design of things though, so I just want to, I just want to um, copy things, but like think about the actual making really. That's uh, so obviously uh, I quite like making planes, little planes, which I'm getting slowly better at, and the stuff. I just like making stuff. I was noticing just the other week that uh, every time I came to the workshop, I left a bit of cake in here or anything like that. I would come back and it'd been half nibbled. And I've discovered who it is. It's the wooden pig. <laughs> and and, he, and I opened them up and you can see there was traces of cake inside of his stomach. He's not finished yet, but this is, the, the trouble is when you start making little daft things like this, you never throw any bits of wood away. He's, he's not finished yet. Yeah, little pig, he's, he's the th th fourth one I've made. And here's the one, there's, uh, uh, there's a work in progress. You're playing, you get your block of wood and you sort in half and you're playing it flat, so it's flat as you can get. And then you excavate the little stomach, then you use a bit of spare violin rib and make terrible unneat mitres, and uh, do it in the same the top and and make a little box. And then once like that, then you saw it out with a coping saw, and then you can carve it. And then you end up with a little pig that eats your sandwiches. So I warn you not to make any. I don't make an elephant, as it'll eat the whole house. So you, all your spare time, you're kind of making something, and I think you get kind of easily <laughs> distracted, is that right? And you kind of have little well, projects here and there in between. Well, uh, uh, the trouble is I seem to be nocturnal. And uh, uh, it's just me lying in bed a bit too much. I, I, I had a part-time job till recently, and uh, I gave that up last year because I'm getting arthritis in my fingers, and I thought I'd rather try and make stuff. But I'm, I suppose it's, a, it's just over a year now, and I'm slowly getting into some kind of system. Another problem I've got is I, I forage for wood a lot, and I've actually totally almost paralysed myself by blocking the whole garage up and uh, with wood. So. That's a warning to the wood foragers. You need to know when to stop or have a big shed you can put things in. I've got a big shed but it's full of other junk. You need to build another shed then to I need, uh, put them more I need to in. forage the wood to make a shed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, maybe have a little Russian doll kind of <laughs> shed. You um, need like a TARDIS basically, don't you? Yeah. You I need don't know to. what I need really. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm still, in, well, I need to try and get cracking anyway because I'm getting old and need to try and make some stuff. But yeah, it's easy to get distracted. Uh, I've always been like this, unfortunately. But you've been making a few um, violins or violin-related oh, yeah. bits oh, I recently. About the violins. Yeah, including you've been making some violins with <laughs> carved lion heads as well, which I'll try and cut in some oh, kind of images of that uh, a bit later. Oh yes, yeah, so uh, during lockdown, I, I, I did this talk in 2015, and I put my little violin aside. Because uh, mainly because I wanted to forge some nails, but I never got access. I tried to make a little forge, which I forged some things in a biscuit tin, but I found that I found these bits of old wrought iron, and I, and I couldn't get it the temperature, and it was uh, it's more it's more of a laminated structure. For, and so when I was heating it, it was just delaminating. I think I needed to get it to a yellow heat, but uh, so so I stopped making the violin with a nailed on neck. So, but during lockdown, I thought I'll make a, a normal violin. And I used Roy Cornell's book mainly, and uh, and I managed to make a little funny violin uh, with Strad posters. I sort of cobbled together several designs, and I, but I didn't really think much about design, so I ended up with this eccentric violin with big corners. But it sounded nice, and, uh, and I played it for a couple of years, and uh, I had it getting sunburnt in the window for about a year, over two years. I was in my stride, and I sort of two more violins, but they seemed to, ground to a, grind to a halt when I started work again after lockdown um, so but I've rekindled them again but unfortunately I think I've forgotten everything that I uh, learnt <laughs> and I'm making the same mistakes again but I think I'm nearly back where I was so but I just need to get need to start making stuff because right? life's <laughs> ebbing away I made my first file in, in lockdown somebody said that I should try using the more of a like, northern European method rather than an inside mould uh, and I haven't really paid too much attention so to the designs, I haven't really paid enough attention. So I, what they said was I could build it in the back and use a, a, a what they call a through neck or a, like an integral neck block. So these are, I, I made the designs up from uh, pictures of violins in the British Violin, uh, which is a British Violin Making Association publication, very nice. Uh, 
So, so this one's based on, well, I'll not tell you what it is, because it doesn't seem to have turned out like it. But I'm, I'm, what it is, I'll just show the interesting features. I built them on the back. So I made the back first. And then I, then I, then I glued the neck on, and I had a trouble, I tried, and I, I glued the neck and the bottom block on. And then uh, I glued corner blocks on this one, and I, and I built it on the back, around the corner blocks. So and I, instead of putting lining on the bottom, I, some violins have these uh, like broken linings. Um, so I did that. So, but um, I tried to do a modernish angle, which so this has got a lot of funny, strange uh, retro features, just as experiments really. Um, but it, the outline is a little bit strange. But it's wood from the local churchyard. Uh, so that one's that one. That one's the more civilized one. And I'm going to put the person on the top. I've just taken so much time. Delayed. Anyway, this is the other one. This is a bit more radical. It's based on one of very small corners, which I shouldn't have done because I was trying to build it in the back again, but without any blocks. And you'd be probably better off with a longer corner, more pinched. And I also tried to make a groove in the back, like a little slopey groove. And it was very stressful and awful to get together. Uh, instead of putting line in, I put in rather like the doing vials. I've used linen, uh, and it's got the throw neck. But this one anyway, I decided to make a funny lion head. There he is. Uh, and but anyway, I'm not a natural sculptor. So what I did was I made several messes in plaster scene. Then I made a funny bulldoggy looking lion in lime wood, and he's very a bit big. But I was sort of gradually getting there somewhere. Looks like he's being head button something. Anyway, there he is. That's the Mark One one. Put him back in his box. <laughs> then I made the Mark Two one, and I don't know what. It's funny actually. It's just come out. It, it looks like a cross between a cat and top. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm practicing anyway, and I'm reducing the size. This is quite funny. A natural sculptor would sort of know, but I, but I, but I would look at this and think, how have I done this? Reminds me of when I was at university. I'd start writing an essay about just say it could have been about the Dutch bulb industry, and I'll end up writing someone else. But anyway, not that I was studying the Dutch bulb industry. Anyway, so here was the um, <laughs> here was the Mark III one. He's getting better, but he's still a bit laboured compared. I was doing this from a photograph. I've got the funny drawings here. Uh, I was doing a photograph in a book of oh, somebody's, somebody's lost forever now. don't know what that was. <laughs> There's the little drones I was using. And I traced them, and I found if you turn the tracing over, you've got two drawings. I was trying to reduce it gradually. I tried to draw it first, but it didn't work. And so there's my little funny plans. And there. So I was gradually getting there. I don't know what that was. It was dropped. I really hate when that happens. But anyway. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, so that's number three, Mark three. And then the Mark four's on there. Then I let two years pass, and I've forgotten all the mistakes I made. They've got little logwood tongues. So I made him smaller, I'll gradually get him smaller. He's getting further further towards something better. And uh, I was doing, took a bit of time with the hair, but he's, the hair's a bit laboured still. Maybe that was what fell. I'll, I'll leave it for a second. Anyway, recently I've been trying to rejuvenate the violins. I've done this perfect, but I've made it a bit too big. But but hopefully I'm going to try and remake my mistakes. And I've been practising making line as I made that one just sort of... Quickly, he, 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 he looks nothing like it, but he's sort of quite nice, sort of funny gothic looking. <laughs> That's in Limewood, uh, from the churchyard. And this is in, uh, I made a better one, this is probably the best one I made. Instead of tracing one, I'd, I'd come up with the idea of just taking a picture on the iPad. And uh, and I thought, oh, I'm going to reverse the photo. So I had this one, I was actually, I was looking at the picture rather than my drone of the picture. Because I didn't want to bring the book in the workshop. Anyway, but he's in Cherry Wood from Dunstan Woods. I don't know why he's making a noise like a pig. I haven't finished his teeth yet. That's it anyway. Uh, the little workshop's a bit full because I just seem to never throw anything out and I like stuff. And there's a little... This one's all potential. Do you think that um, more violins are going to be your next project or are there other things that you'd like uh, to well, did, work on? I did start a few guitars back in about 2015, uh, 16. And they, they seem to ground to a halt after about a year. I, just seem to, I need to just stick to something. I want to, what I want to do next is, um, last year there was quite a lot of poplar got blown down. And I thought this poplar, I've got loads of it and I've locked the garage up with it. Um, I thought it was a bit too soft, but I showed it to somebody, a violin maker, and he said, make a viola. 
So I want to make a viola with a one piece back. And I've, uh, I'm sort of, I'm not very good at thinking about the design. So I, I thought, in the old days I've heard about people getting a strad in for repair and drawing around it. So what I've done is I've, I've taken some screenshots of some violins, plans, and I've enlarged them up to 16 inches with a very old fashioned in, inaccurate ruler. And I've traced it with tracing paper. So I've got my outline like that and I'll, I can show you that if you want to make <laughs> But I want to make a viola with one piece back based on, on a Strad. Just because it's the one with, it's popular. Um, yeah, I want to make a viola next. I've got big fat hands, so viola seems to suit me as well. I'm not a very good player, I just play, but I play in tunish anyway. I think a viola would be quite a nice project with that wood, especially as you say, like a one piece back. Because uh -huh. I'd, quite, I'd quite like to build a viola as well. I think that could be quite an interesting project. Uh -huh. So maybe we should have a little competition <laughs> and see uh -huh. if we can both uh, uh -huh. get du one made. Duel and banjo. Uh, Duel and yeah. Yes, I know. But yeah, yeah, we should. But it, I, I'm so lazy. I haven't managed to cut you any wood yet. <laughs> but never mind. I it, think we'll get there happen. eventually. It'll happen eventually, yeah. So for anyone that might be interested in making instruments or just crafts in general or kind of any woodworking, do you have any advice for people that might be like a little bit nervous about starting or unsure of what to focus on? Depends what you want to do. There's, I don't know how many classes it is these days, but I read a, lot, I read a bit about people on this website thing. And uh, the advice I would say, if you want to make violins, I think if you can get somebody, if you can get a, um, like a mentor, Somebody can show you, because because when you when you're working from books, it's okay, but but you can make a lot of mistakes and you'll, your pro progress will be a lot slower. Uh, I would say as well, you've got to really learn how to sharpen tools, and then you pro and, a, and another thing as well is probably buy buy the minimum amount of tools, and don't get bogged down because I've got too many and you yeah end up thinking I'll try that one and, you, and I end up just sort of reconditioning tools all the time. But yeah, but look, you can look around car boot sales for, for old tools once you know what you're looking for what you're looking for but uh, yeah there's some good books I would say Roy Cortnell is, is probably the best value book uh, the Cortnell and Johnson book for violin making that's what in my opinion there's other books but they're expensive uh, in America there's other there's other books Strobel and Harry Wake and stuff and there's a Brian Dibber's book it's very nice but it's expensive uh, um, but yeah, Roy Cottonell and, and Johnson, is that what it's called? Anyway, uh, but yeah, if you could get a mentor, that would give you a lot of thing. But even then, I think, even if you just enjoy a lot of thing, that makes sense. That'll give you a lot of, um, it'll speed you up, it'll give you a good leg up. But um, I would say there's something nice about playing in a bit of wood. Even if, I think it's learning how to play would be a good start. There's something nice when you get a, just a bit of nice clear pine and get a shape. And if you look, if you, you can find Japanese planing competitions, I wouldn't advocate going that far. They, where they measure the, the shaving and it's transparent and stuff. But there's something nice about getting a well set of plane. And the wooden planes are nice, you can pick up at carbon sales, but, but don't because I want them. So that's the other thing, you also collect quite a lot of um, old tools and planes, don't you? I so do, you're uh, quite, yeah. quite knowledgeable really about. Uh, well, it's mainly self-taught, you see, that's the trouble, and I've picked up stuff. And the trouble is, I've, I realise I've been doing stuff wrong for years. Uh, when I went to college, I was already doing woodwork, so, I, so I, in a one way I would have probably been better off. In one way I wouldn't have been, I would have been bored. But if I'd started at the beginners uh, on the OND instead of the HND, uh, I would have been shown, so, like for example, I'd never really done cross-planing before. But seeing that, it was in the book. If you, uh, the best book for guitar making is Com Compiano and Natelson. That seems to be the best book still. And he's got updates online as well, which are good to look at. Uh, he's got he's improved the neck jointing. He had an insane neck jointing thing with a draw ball pin and tongs. And nobody ever could do that apart from them. But he's got improved, so... I forgot what I was saying, really. <laughs> don't, don't wait until you get too old, you just forget everything. <laughs> But yeah, it's just enjoyable, you know. I think that's the main thing if, you enjoy, if it's enjoyable. But if you can get advice, that, that, can, that can really save you a lot of wasted time and put you, steer you along the wrong path. Uh, whereas I've been a, a bit like being self taught's great in a way. I did work at school, but a lot of it I, I sort of got from old books and messing around with wouldn't. But you do actually make, you know, you do progress a bit quite a lot slower that way in some ways. 
It's good to work with peers sometimes, isn't it? I think I remember studying. It's quite good to be in a workshop with other people, oh, yeah. and you can kind of get little bits of advice from people. Obviously, you're like your lecturers as well and other craftspeople, oh. but people on the same course as you. I don't know if you felt the same, but I always felt that in some ways I learned a lot more from some of the technicians and some of the other students oh. than sometimes from. It was a mixture of things. Obviously, you learn a lot of the good techniques from your lecturers as well but i felt that everyone was kind of pushing each other along a bit oh, which yeah. i think they is, say that is, is a bit good of a, bit of a competition could go on first one to get finished a little bit um and that one thing i would say as well that you have to you gotta be a little bit pushy because i used to find that i'd be standing there hovering and a lot, a lot of people don't like hoverers and i didn't want to say hey excuse me can i i would be standing while somebody else would just be like sucking all the knowledge out of the lecture for half an hour while I'd be waiting and I'd say, can I have, the, can I have a small drill? <laughs> so and I, so I think if, if you're not sure about something, you've got to not be shy about asking for advice. Obviously, you don't want to be going around pushing and being, you don't want to go around putting people off you. But, if, but the trouble is, if you're on a course, uh, I did find that there were some people who were quite happy, but they didn't realise they were doing it. It was sort of their personalities. They were quite happy. Or maybe they'd seen me once I get started talking. <laughs> maybe I was doing the same thing. But yes, I did feel sometimes that some people would sort of monopolise the time of the lectures. Mm. But yeah, so I think the key is just to, when you've got the opportunity, just grab it and just kind of learn from whatever sources you can. I guess be respectful of people's time, but, oh, yeah. but try and get that kind of information while oh, you can. Oh, so. you yeah, don't want to become like the person I've just been talking. You want to be... Uh, <laughs> You want to be a happy medium. Yeah. And also, if, you, if, you be, if you're too pushy, people will not like that as well, probably. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we just have to uh, mention this amazing guitar. Uh, I've done a little separate video um, just when you explaining about this particular instrument. But this is, like, absolutely incredible. Like, I've, I've not seen a guitar this kind of big in person before. Um, I know like you've said that this is based on a historical kind of model and there I have seen pictures of other guitars of this side uh, but this really is it's quite something uh, it's not exactly the same uh, I made up the design I made it too flat on the bottom so it stands up <laughs> I've still haven't put a strap button on it's, I've only it's only been made since 1997 and uh, but it's this one has the neck has moved a bit I made it truss rod uh, but these guitars you don't often see them because because they're a bit like the dodo, they can't fly and they're very big, <laughs> and I think people used to club them and eat them. <laughs> but it's it's got a funny sound. It's got a nice sound anyway. But but a lot of people kind of hold it. But luckily I've got long arms, so I can hold it like that. But it, but I, I noticed a proper guitar player was playing, and I noticed he was struggling, and I realised he was wanting to get his hand in a nice sweet spot. But I saw the best place, the best way to hold one of these if you happen to catch one. The, the originals were bigger, they were deeper. And they were in Rosewood as well, they were in Brazilian Rosewood. And, I, and they were two-piece, I think, as well. So poor big trees. They've got, this is four bits. But, uh, but it has a nice sound. <laughs> when you play it right, it has. <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? I'm not used to it anymore, this guitar. But, but that's why if you move your hand, you see from there, you get a... And then you move your hand there, you get nice. Don't know what I'm playing. I'll get them right eventually if I live to be a hundred. No, I think it's brilliant. It really, really it's a great. Nice sounding yeah, guitar. really nice sounding, really interesting guitar. It almost yeah. has a sort of breathy sound. Doesn't yeah, it? it's got a good, good resonance to Somebody it. Somebody was so. suggesting it would be good for doing lower tunings with. I don't know. I don't know. That would be big for changing tunes. I'm not used to the guitar. It's probably old age as well. I definitely can see some movements happen. Mm. Those strings have got higher.
play it anymore. That's but brilliant. It's definitely yeah. got a funny uh, action now. Like. Whereas this one, this is a smaller one. <laughs> you can tell because it's smaller. <laughs> I can get it out. I didn't want to come out shy. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, that is quite a difference, isn't it? Oh, it really yes. is. Really, this is what happens really lovely rosette, actually. I really like the, the colour of it. Oh, it's really, made, really nice. I, I bought red veneer and we made, uh, made our own little heron bone. Mm, that was a right Really, really there. beautiful, yeah. But um, I can, this one's got a better action. I can do it. I can't really play this one either. <laughs> Never mind. They're very, very nice guitars. guitars yeah. right. They're all right. They've held. I, I didn't put any taper on the body as well. That was another problem. I took it to this guitar shop and showed them. And he says, "Oh, it looks like a guitar. There should be a bit of taper on the body." But I just forgot. <laughs> Made them parallel. <laughs> no, but anyway, like it. it's, it's the second, the, the third, and fourth guitars I've made. I'm not used to either of them. I'm just used to that funny little one. I think we are very close to the rain actually looking, well, at, the, feel it looking at the weather um, but yeah Andrew thank you so much for taking the time just to kind of speak with me a little bit about some of what we've done uh, we obviously haven't captured everything that you've done because you've done so many different things with kind of crafts and I musical think instruments the ancient, so. you, you, you've done a bit more <laughs> I'll, put them, I'll put them away i think you've done lots and lots of interesting stuff so um for anyone that's interested i'll put a link to the loot society article about andrew's work on historical loot construction i'm sure there's other information floating about as well i'll also include um some other images and videos um, check out the channel for other videos about some of andrew's instruments and things that he's working on tools um other craft stuff so yeah once again thank you so much uh, andrew for taking the time and thanks a lot for everyone for watching <laughs> <laughs> bye i'm not totally good at anything and, uh, and i would say my main talent is if i have one is it's just being interested in stuff and uh and uh being curious and just persistent and I think the main thing is you have fun. I'm not particularly good, some, you know, but I, I think it's the main thing is you have fun.